Cool. I wonder if we should begin. Yeah, let's go for it. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our show and share session. Uh, just a reminder for everybody of what these sessions are about. It's about showing what progress we've made over the last couple of weeks. It's giving everybody an opportunity to feedback, comment, and get involved. Okay, so the ambition of the project, which lots of you have been attending regularly will be fully aware of now. Um, in particular, draw your attention to the words in the orange at the bottom there. Understood, fair, accessible and beneficial to all our residents. So a couple of quotes um, that we got from Jennifer Winter, our head of service, um, when we started to talking about the vision for the project. In particular, the one on the left has become central to everything we do. Everything that everybody does should be geared around preventing homelessness. So um, this is a diagram illustrating levels of vulnerability. Um, so the section at the top is applied, will be applied to customers that we consider to be least vulnerable um, and have more assets. And what we're hoping to do is to equip them with self-sourcing, self-service type tools so that they can progress along that journey by themselves with limited interaction from the staff. Then the people in the middle, which is the light blue area, these are people that are still able and have lots of assets are able to do lots of things for themselves, but need a little bit more of nudging coaching, try persuading from ourselves. So with them, there would be tools in place to do that. And we'd also be starting to introduce the idea of a shared plan. And then at the bottom, ever, ever increasing cohort of customers uh, with multiple and complex problems that we would be looking to employ techniques such more or as a multidisciplinary team to move forward with them. So this translates onto our uh, road map or tube map of the service. So you can see the colours translate across. Um, those people more are go able to help themselves are going across the self-service orange line. Um, those that need a bit more support there are in the light blue where we've got create a shared plan, check in and nudge. And the people at the bottom are the ones that will be doing more multidisciplinary plans and collaborating with third parties and other areas of the council. There's a couple of stops that we've added onto this. Um, first, you'll see at the top there, information advice, because it might just be that a lot of our customers just come in, need some information advice, and go away and sort their, sort their own issues out, so to speak. And then there's the other stop down on the blue lines for crisis support. So some people may only be approaching us because they're particularly in an element of crisis at that point. Um, if we could help them resolve that, again, we may well, they may well be able to do much more to help themselves. So these are the service principles that were developed early on in the project, and these underpin everything we're doing within the project on a daily basis. So where are we now? So we're going to be waving goodbye um, to regular updates in the form of the show and shares on single view and the waiting time tool. The waiting time tool, as you will all be aware from the show and share a couple of weeks ago, from the emails that have come down recently is now live on the website. Single view, everybody, like the majority of people here will be using that daily. That's been handed over to our own ICT team and you'll be able to report any kind of issues with that through the support desk in the usual manner. But we will provide an updates on both of these going forward and information will be available on the Google Plus community. So what are we working on now? Um, so we've been continuing the work on collaborative casework. Um, in particular, use of the SMS tool and scaling the shared plan. Uh, understanding vulnerability, as you all know, was put on, was on hold for a while um, and is now very much back as part of this sprint. The doc upload tool, which was started to be rapidly developed in response to some of the issues we've had with the COVID-19 crisis. And we're starting to look at self-service tools to assist those people that will be going along the orange line. So we will get updates today on shared plan, SMS check-in tool, document upload, and understanding vulnerability. Cool. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so as Claire was just talking, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for all coming. Um, I'm just going to provide some brief, quick updates around the SMS check-in tool and the doc upload. So just as a kind of recap 
the SMS check-in tool is a kind of a way to have conversations, a two-way conversation with the resident. Uh, 78 of you are currently using this tool and we kind of hope to kind of get a few more on to the tool um, kind of by the end of the week or by the end of next week. So look out for some more details on Google Plus after this. But kind of some quick stats are 180 texts per week and 26 per day. And at the moment, around 30% of all residents have kind of replied to a message so far. So this is a really good statistic in terms of having that kind of two-way conversation and kind of helping residents kind of access the, the best options that they can. Um, here's a really nice quote from one of the Benefits and Housing Needs Officer from this week. Um, so I'm using it a lot and in light of what's going on at the moment, it is a really superb tool in getting documents from the claimants quicker. So we're hopefully ha have a bit more of an update for you in two weeks around the SMS tool and the kind of direction it's going to take. Um, but we're very excited to keep rolling on with it. Um, and then sort of the doc upload. So this is kind of a tool that we released a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago now. And it's kind of test helping us test a new way for residents to kind of take a photo of the evidence or any supporting documents that they may need and sort of upload it from their smartphone and gives all the kind of officers a way to kind of go into this tool to kind of take those documents out and then kind of put them into the systems that they need and to kind of action them going from there. So over the last two weeks, we've seen more and more uploads um, and we're currently kind of when given the option to upload using the tool. Eight of nine residents still prefer to send the documents via email, but we're starting to test with a number um, more staff over the kind of next two weeks, um, and we're hoping to test this with the business support team very soon. Um, so hopefully that will kind of provide more light and kind of the best ways to kind of use this tool and kind of the more new features that could be could create a better experience for some of the officers. So here's a bit of feedback that we received over the last two weeks. Uh, the uploader is a quicker way of accessing documents from our claimants. It would be great if there was, was some way to differentiate between which documents are for other officers. So if you have used the tool currently, um, you can just see all the documents there and with the resident that uploaded them. Um, but we're hoping to kind of implement some sort of stat, some feature that will kind of show what documents are for you and what's for other officers. So look out for that. And there will also be some more news on this on the Google Plus community um, around how you can sign up to use this if you wish. And I will be passing on now to talk about the shared plan to Chris Winsley. Good morning, everybody. So we've been continuing to work on the shared plan, which is a tool for officers and residents to collaborate on a plan of action. Um, so as a recap, this shared plan fits into the overall service vision. So there are different levels of shared plans. So on the light blue line, we anticipate being able to use a shared plan in quite a light touch way to check in with the resident and provide step-by-step -step actions for them to help themselves. And then on the dark blue line, it's about using the shared plan to support more complex cases between professionals in a multidisciplinary and collaborative way. So where we left off, so over the last few months, we've been testing an initial prototype of the basic shared plan concept and some of our assumptions around that. Um, so now we have more confidence around that. We've um, designed up a vision for where we hope the shared plan will ultimately get to. And we showed that to you at the last show and share, and we got some really good feedback um, from you. So thank you very much for that. Um, so here's some of the feedback in, uh, about ideas and improvements of where we should go with the show plan. So we've got um, the ability to add multiple officers um, to collaborate on a plan together and for them to be able to update the plan in real time without having to save and refresh. Um, the ability for them to have uh, uh, automatic prompts and reminders when a plan has been updated and to make it clearer when a plan has been shared with the client, make it clear when actions have been agreed with the client. Um, and to double check that we've entered the right phone number before sharing because we don't want to be sharing it with the wrong people. Um, and also to add some additional security features, particularly for those in more uh, the most vulnerable positions to make sure that um, nobody else is accessing that data. And then ultimately, can we replace the PHP and Jigsaw altogether? 
So what's next? Um, so we started to build the shared plan, we're laying foundations. Uh, we've got some more technical things to do, which Matt's going to talk to you about in a minute. And we also need to continue to test the plan and our assumptions around that. Um, so what we start to see first in the design, so the early version of the shared plan will include a quick link access from single view to make it easy for you to create a shared plan. Um, it will notify you if the resident already has a PHP and there will be the option for multiple people to collaborate on a plan together. Um, there'll be the ability to add details and links to an action so you can provide a bit more information around how the resident needs to complete that. And it will also pull in the phone number and the email automatically from single view so you won't have to worry that you're sending it to the wrong person. And as we spoke before, we're going to introduce some additional security measures as well. Good morning. Uh, before we get into it, I just, in the text, with the tech stuff, we uh, talk about the cloud quite a lot. So I thought I'd drop a little definition here and in here on what the cloud is. Um, cloud computing, it's basically uh, the delivery of on-demand on computing services. So that's your applications, your storage, that sort of thing. Typically, over the internet, normally no cats involved. Um, so this last couple of weeks, um, we had some really important stuff we needed to get out of the way. Um, the first thing, cloud infrastructure is code. So all the cloud components that the application runs on, your servers, your databases, file storage, etc., cetera, um, we define them using code. And then when we run that code, um, all those components are automatically set up for us. Um, we've added automated tests. So now um, the application is checked every time we add new code uh, just to make sure it's still running. And we've added automated deploys. So once we've added new code, a new feature, um, our updated applications automatically pushed into the cloud. And this means that updates can be pushed out nice and quick and users and the users are always using the most up-to-date version of the application. Um, what does all this mean? Basically, we're laying the foundations to build the application in the best way possible. Um, less manual tasks means less human error. Uh, the infrastructure's code thing means that the application can be moved or scaled more easily if required. Uh, we'll end up with less bugs and just an overall better experience for everyone. Nice one. Thanks, Matt. So I'll tell you about a couple of places that we are looking to test the shared plan. And we're looking to try a version of the shared plan across all three of our different journeys on the tube map. So we've had lots of ideas coming through about how we might use the shared plan as part of the new uh, COVID-19 accommodation. So working with Claire and Arto, we know there's quite a large group of residents with low support needs who are most likely non-priority and need to self-source their own accommodation. So how can we use a version of this shared plan to help people help themselves um, and move towards self-sourcing? We also, as mentioned, want to make sure that when the shared plan um, needs to be a personal housing plan, uh, that it can work as that. So we want to try this out as a replacement to the PHP on Jigsaw um, along the middle line. And then on the bottom line, again, in COVID-19 accommodation, uh, working with residents at Central Park who have multiple and complex needs and are working with a number of professionals, how can we get all of those professionals to feed into a single plan? And what we want to learn through testing these, first of all, with that self-service plan, do residents engage with it and is it actually useful? Is it helping people take steps along their journey towards self-sourcing and doing something extra? Along that middle line, we absolutely need to make sure that when there's a legal requirement for a personal housing plan, that the shared plan can have all of that content there. We want to know what format um, staff and residents prefer and actually what is resulting in more action and better outcomes for people. And then along the bottom line, are partners willing to do this? Are they willing to engage around a shared plan? And does this help build a shared understanding of what someone's needs are and a more coordinated response and casework? So this is a call out uh, to you, particularly people in the housing advice and options team. Uh, we want you to try out, or we're inviting you to try out that early version of the shared plan that Chris mentioned instead of a personal housing plan. 
We want to see what you prefer, um, what works for residents and what results in better outcomes. And so we will make sure in this test that this is absolutely not something you are doing on top of a PHP, that this will, for the duration of, of this test, replace it. Um, because we know you all have so much on at the moment and the last thing we want to do is ask you to do um, to be duplicating work anyway. So this is a big shout out um, to get in contact with any of our team. Um, you could give Claire a shout if you would like to be involved in the battle of the plans. And I'll now tell you a little bit about understanding vulnerability. And so this is all about building a bigger picture of the resident and their situation when they make contact with any part of the service. So you will remember this is um, quite an important part in, in the service vision in the tube map. It helps us when someone approaches understand what uh, vulnerabilities they might have and also what assets they have so that we can determine what level of service is appropriate for them. So I'm just going to give you a brief recap. I know it's been a couple of months since we've spoken about this. So a brief recap on some of the work that we've done around this to date. And then we are going to jump into an activity um, to think about how we can move this forward. So understanding vulnerability. Um, the belief that underpins all of this is that understanding how vulnerable someone is at any contact through the service will help us catch things early and stop things escalating will help us understand what level of intervention is suitable, as in how able is someone to help themselves, and therefore that can free up time um, for officers in the service to work with people who are the most vulnerable and the most in need. So this really is about figuring out, is it the orange line, the light blue line, or the dark blue line that is appropriate for that person? We have tested a number of concepts so far, and the middle one has disappeared. Um, the first one was a paper prototype, which we tested with the benefits team. And this was about helping people ask different questions um, about someone's financial situation, um, about what else is going on in their life, and just picking up on their kind of gut feeling, professional expertise, um, and spidey sense. Um, if, if it was indicated, that that person might be vulnerable. And then we looked at ways that we might be able to document that as part of single view. So we had a way to enter a little free text case note <clears throat> into single view. And then also a more visual uh, checklist, which was like a, a couple of tiles um, that you could click and identify what someone's vulnerabilities were, again, through single view. Oh, there we go, um, nice, nice transition there, it's just appeared. So in the previous, uh, a couple of months ago, we were testing this whole process with the benefits team. So we were encouraging people to pick up on those signs that you already spot that indicate someone might be at risk of homelessness. So with the benefits team, one of those things was employment support allowance ending, indicating that that person actually had quite a high level of need and they were no longer in receipt of that benefit. So when that happened, we were asking people to just take a little bit of time and build a bigger picture about what is going on um, with the resident and their situation. So asking some open questions about various parts of their life, um, from family uh, to health to financial situation. And documenting a snapshot about that resident's level of vulnerability in time. And then we also wanted to look at this third step. So if you do think someone is vulnerable through doing those first two, what is a step that you could take to go above and beyond your duty? And that could be anything from making a referral to another team, sending people some information and advice or other organisations they might want to look at or get support from, or build a really light touch shared plan with actions for the resident and actions for you. What we learned through doing this was this gave officers the space to think a little bit deeper about the resident's situation there was the most popular tool was this kind of tiled one that was more visual and it didn't feel as kind of heavy handed to document someone's vulnerabilities. It felt quite easy just to click a couple of things. That through giving people uh, tools to capture vulnerabilities, people did do something different as a result. They might have taken a bit more time to look through single view and see what was going on as a whole picture. They might have phoned the resident, um, asked them additional questions or offered support. But there was still a bit of uncertainty around that third step. 
you know, what actual practical next steps can we take to support someone who's vulnerable? And also that this was a useful prompt and way into working in this way. Uh, but there's more that we can do to help give people the support um, and permission and confidence to work in this way. So what is next as we kick off understanding vulnerability again? We want to test that whole process, but this time with more teams. So not just with the benefits team, um, but other teams across the service. To go through that, that simple process from spotting a sign, capturing a snapshot, and taking a step to prevent homelessness. We want to include some prompts or suggested next steps of what that step could be. What could you do next if you identify someone as vulnerable? We also want to look at how we can capture a resident's strengths and assets. So this little wheel on the right is something that um, we test, well, we drew up last time, but never got a chance to test. So understanding um, is, is someone's financial situation stable? Have they got a support network around them? How engaged are they? Um, how resilient are they? How have they managed things like this in the past? And capturing a snapshot of those things as well. And we're also really keen to get your input on what, um, what can we do to help you work in this way? Is that um, particular targets? It might be stories about officers going above and beyond um, and taking steps to prevent homelessness. So we need your input to shape um, how we can set up this way of working across the service. So really, understanding vulnerability is a bit of a building block for working in this way. And you can start to see how this ties in with a number of the other tools. So for example, the first one, um, understanding a resident's journey and the interactions they've had with the service so far, you're already doing that with single view. We then want to give you some really simple tools to build a bigger picture, whether that is asking open questions, being able to kind of document and capture vulnerabilities and assets really easily, and then support to kind of agree um, and meet that person's need by taking action. That might be building a shared plan, or it might be sending them a text message through the SMS tool. So these start to all fall together in a bit of a journey. I'll now hand over to Claire to talk about some of the ways you can get involved. So it's that time again where I start my nagging. Um, you can't have, usually a lot of you have been ruling my desk for a long time. As we're no longer in the HSC, it's going to become much more difficult to avoid me. Um, we were, on a serious note, we really want people to get involved in this. You, you guys are the experts. We know everybody's under a lot of pressure at this time, but in some ways that gives us an ideal opportunity to try out new things. There may well be better ways of doing some of the things that you're working on at the moment that might help relieve the pressure. So if anybody wants to get involved in any of the areas we've been talking about, and they're all on the slide there, um, give me a shout. Um, I will be coming back and hassling you. Thank you very much. Fab. So we have a fair chunk of time left. So we might spend 10 or 15 minutes doing an activity if people are able to stick around and stay on the line. In the previous phase, we did quite a lot of work understanding what some of the characteristics are that would suggest someone was vulnerable. So we ran a number of workshops. Um, with the service, with adult social care, with mental health teams. We did some activities at Show and Shares to understand um, what kind of vulnerability indicators and assets um, you already pick up on and started to kind of prioritise what some of those things are that would suggest that someone needs uh, more support um, or suggest that someone is vulnerable. So we did a bunch of work in the previous phase around this. And now we really want to get your input to crowdsource if you spot someone as vulnerable in particular scenarios um, or presenting in a particular way, what are the possible next steps that you or other officers could take in the service to help uh, prevent that person's homelessness? These might be really small things from making a referral to another team um, to suggesting a, a website that someone checks out or a different organisation they can go to or it might be some actions that you can take together as part of a shared plan. Fab. So if you are able to grab your mobile, if you've got it nearby, or open a new tab and go to that web address, which is www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and enter the code 827091. We have um, a number of questions here, and we'll go through these one by one. 
you can submit a response, you can submit multiple responses if you have lots of ideas, um, and this is all totally anonymous. Um, and what we'd like to do is go through these scenarios one by one, um, ask people to take a minute or two to think about some answers, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion around each one um, if um, people want to come off mute and suggest things. So this is amazing, we've already got things coming through. The first scenario um, is a resident mentions they often don't have enough money to pay their rent every month. So we're looking to crowdsource your ideas about what additional step could you take to go above and beyond your duty. And this will help us build a bank of things um, that can support other teams, that could support customer services, potentially in the future support partners. Um, this is quite a common scenario that came out of all of that previous work that we did. So we'll leave it for a minute or so. You can submit multiple answers to this question. As I said, it's totally anonymous. Um, and also if you jump back onto the Hangouts tab, you'll be able to see other answers coming through. Fab, so we've got loads of ideas coming through already. Um, feel free to keep adding things. We'll be using all of these um, and building up a bit of a knowledge bank. So we've got signpost to budgeting tools, schedule a meeting to understand how they currently spend their money. Have they reviewed their spending habits? Refer to finance options on Hackney website. We've got loads coming through, about 20 or so. Point them to housing benefits or universal credit. Ask further questions to get an idea about debt problems. Check they're getting all benefits they may be entitled to. Um, ask if they use a monthly budget. Suggest written ones or the money advice website as a budget planner. DHP. Oh, we've got loads coming through. We've got 30 already. As these keep coming through, I wonder if someone would like to come off mute and talk about something that they've suggested um, that would be a good option for someone who doesn't have enough money to pay their rent every month. I would. Hiya. Hiya, it's Genevieve. Um, basically, I found when we were working on the debt project that people who have debt issues many times have not taken the time to really look at their spending habits and once we and it's it's letting them look at those via their bank statement do they keep receipts and really taking a look at what they're spending their money on because many times that's a surprise and it shows them where they can make changes if they want to and that's just also a way to remind a client it's not up to me to decide what's important to the client but if they see that they're spending x amount of money on beauty products or X amount of money on takeaways, those are things that can be changed. But if they can't be, what other areas can be? So I think it's it's looking at those spending habits and then using a budget of some sort. And some people are old school, like a piece of paper. Here's what I bring in. Here's what I take out. Other people like a website. So I, I think it's really key, though, to analyze spending habits. And, and that's my comment. That's fab. Thanks, Genevieve. Sorry, Emily, can I come back on that? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned with that response, to be honest, because effectively, while we, you know, for, for the most vulnerable people in certain circumstances, the issues are not about, you know, we should be policing their spend, you, you know, go up smoking, eat healthy, blah, blah, blah. Effectively, these are, you know, in many cases, these are the comforts that people return to because they are familiar with and they are easy wins for them in terms of their lifestyle and all their uh, life choices. They can control that. They can't control other aspects. And so they mm. tend to focus on those areas. But I think we need to be careful with how we couch that. This is not, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. Stop doing that. You know, this is about, um, you know, what are actually the priorities and how we have to be organised and be a priority. 
Um, can I just say, it's Josie here. I worked on the debt project with uh, Genevieve. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I found that it's really, you have to kind of look at everything with someone. It's, it's not just focusing on what their income in, is and what their outgoings are. It's about what's happening with, the, with them in their private life. What pressures are they under? Um, are there underlying mental health issues or you know, perhaps they're drinking too, you know, they've got an alcohol problem. Um, it's, I mean, just basic things as well, like uh, making sure that they are getting all the benefits that they're entitled to. Um, quite a few were not getting benefits that they should be getting. So it's looking at it overall. Um, one of them had a housing benefit overpayments that she'd written in and written in but it wasn't till I spoke to her and got to the nitty-gritty of it that I worked out so I got a like 800 pound overpayment written off for her so it's just you have to kind of look at everything and really listen to the person because it's about their life and it might be something in their life that's interfering with them being able to um you know deal with debt properly as well so and charities things like that there's a lot of help out there that um can help them apart from our DHPs uh, anyway, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> there you go, Josie. You got to call that, as Josie said. <laughs> no, I think that's brilliant. I think they're all very, very valid points, and I think a lot of the, 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 the thinking behind doing understanding vulnerability is looking at all of those different um, things together, building a, a holistic picture of someone's situation, not just taking something in isolation. So this is all. This is all brilliant content that will help us start to think about if someone captures something about um, not having enough money or financial instability, all of your ideas here can help us start to build a bank of suggested actions and next steps, which is brill. We'll jump onto the next scenario, uh, which is through speaking to a resident, you learn that their partner has recently died. So this again was something that came out of the previous work that someone might be vulnerable if they've gone through uh, an emotional shock um, a bereavement that could start to impact other areas of their life. So if you learnt this through a conversation that you were having with a resident, is there any additional step that you might be able to take um, in order to help that person and ultimately to prevent um, homelessness? So again, you are very welcome to enter more than one answer on this question. So again, this was something that came out through the previous work we did in Understanding Vulnerability, that if someone's gone through an emotional shock, um, particularly a bereavement um, of a child or a partner, um, that that could indicate that they were particularly vulnerable at that point in time, and there might be additional steps that we could take as a service to support them. So some of the things that are coming through, point them to tell us once, find out if they need time to handle their grief, mental health support, find out who they need to notify and facilitate that process, check if they have a support network they could use and help them to use it. Again, kind of leaning on family and friends um, if they're not able to cope with basic issues, other people that they can make aware. So it's not we had any more clarity than we had at the beginning of it, especially when you then compare it with what's going on elsewhere. So I think... So we've got about 20 answers coming through now. Would anyone like to come off mute and explain um, their thinking behind this or things they think that we could do as a service to support people in this situation? I don't have a crack if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. A lot of this is, is again, particularly with bereavement, the issues of when you're not used to handling, you know, significant change, it becomes very overwhelming. Uh, it becomes, you know, uh, and you don't know where which to, you know, where to start, where to begin, 
effectively, if you can start to break, help that person break that down into a number of small steps. Okay, what well, we need to do this, and then we need to do that. So, have we registered the death? Who's got the certificates? Okay, well, right, let's make a list of people who would need a copy. So, how many copies do I need? Those sort of very small steps. Uh, and then we can start moving the process on. If you just say to somebody, you need to notify, you know, um, the uh, utilities. That's, it's, it, you, know, you need to tell them, you know, give them a bit more than that. And what you will need to do is send them a, 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 a covering letter and a copy of the birth certificate. And here's, a, you know, a, 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 the person you need to send it to. Those sort of smaller tasks. We can break it down into that sort of, you know, uh, level of engagement in terms of, these are, you know, you know, right, these are the steps you need to take and these are the order you need to take them in. I think that can, you know, that that be really helpful for for uh, you know, people who are, you know, literally, you know, oh, as I say, you know, it's sort of caught in the in the in the in the headlights as it were of a of a mm. you know even. Yeah, thank you, Ian. There's something here as well. Um, I wonder if anyone wants to talk to kind of speaking to other council departments. So highlight on their records, report and change to council tax and other departments that need notifying. Has anyone got any thoughts around that? I'm, I do. Hello. Hello. I do. Um, I, I've, I've handled um, a loss before and you sort of get knocked out of kilter and you don't know sort of which way to turn, as Ian was saying. And um, sometimes you need everybody else to know that you need that support as well. So if I, as an officer, know that the person needs support, but I don't let other people know that that person has gone through a, has gone through a loss and they require a level of support, then they sort of end up feeling lost when they travel from department to department. So it would help to sort of spread that awareness mm. that the person requires that support. Mm. So my thoughts on the issue. Thank you. So that, that really makes a case for kind of highlighting this on their case so that anyone else who's looking at their record is able to, to not ask those same questions, to kind of see what conversations have already been had and respond in an appropriate way. Would anyone else like to comment on anything that's come through here, either their own um, or someone else's that sparked something? No, we've got, we've got plenty more. I'll jump on to the next one. Uh, so a resident mentions they've recently been convicted of antisocial behaviour. So this came out of some of the workshops as a, an indicator, again, that someone might be vulnerable, that there could be far more going on in someone's life. Um, and this could be a bit of a symptom of that. So if you heard this in a conversation with a resident, are there any additional steps that you could take to go above and beyond? Um, to support that person as um, in that vulnerable situation. Who's going to be the first to submit? Oh, there we go. Got a couple now. So again, I think, I mean, potentially this is quite a, quite a difficult one because it could, could be a symptom of a, of a much kind of broader, more complex situation. But again, it might be an early indicator that that person is extremely vulnerable. So it'd be great to build up um, some of your ideas about things that the service could do. Um, and then in the future, these might be things that um, other services, like customer services or partners, might be able to respond with as well. So we've got a couple of things coming through. Find out how they're feeling as there may be underlying issues that are causing that behaviour. Finding out what services that person is already linked with liaise with the housing or liaise with housing services or their landlord to make sure they're supported so that that ASV doesn't end in eviction. If they have support issues, find out their names and contact details. 
do they recognise that their behaviour is antisocial? Find out how to support them in understanding responsibilities within the context of their need. Ask them what happened, if they're aware of what ASB is. Are they aware of the consequences? Do they need any help? What's the support network? So again, that might be asking broader questions, prompting around other areas of that person's life. Are there any mental health issues? Do they have any support issues? Could point them to support or advice groups. So if anyone has any ideas about what groups or organizations might be out there, feel free to pop those in as an answer as well. Would anyone like to comment on, on this, whether they submitted an answer or not? Have you got any thoughts on this as a, as a situation? Hi, um, it's Andrew just asking a quick question. Well, when it comes down to any social behaviour, don't they get warnings or some kind of um, triggers before they actually get convicted? And if so, that might be the time to actually be working on it. And um, mm. if you get notified of a warning, then actually jump on it before it gets to that stage. Hello, James here from Housing Services. Um, yeah, ideally... There's a sort of an escalation of warnings, but sometimes if it's really bad, you can just skip all that and go straight for, depending on the what has gone on, you can go straight for the appropriate action. But yeah, ideally, you would hopefully my office would be working to try and prevent that escalating and getting out of hand. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you both. Anyone got any other thoughts on whether that is a warning um, or a conviction of ASB? So maybe we can broaden it out to either a warning or a conviction because that might encourage more, um, more answers to come through. There, great. We've got some examples of places we might be able to point people to. Would anyone else like to comment on this as a, as a scenario that suggests someone might be vulnerable? No? Okay, maybe we'll do two more and then we'll finish in, in five minutes or so. Oh, quick, quickly, would we consider not having access to the internet since we've seen your, your amazing new work and software? Would having not having access to the internet be deemed as vulnerable nowadays? There's certainly a, a cost, I think, money-wise. I think some the debt device sector did some work quite a while back about not being attached to the internet does have an impact financially. Mm. do lose out on deals, but that, would we consider that a vulnerability now? I mean, I'd throw that out to everyone else. It's, we've, we've heard that, I guess, the flip side of that, James, so that, you know, having, being like, having access to the internet and having good IT skills can be seen as a bit of an asset, um, but haven't actually looked at it the other way. So I wonder if anyone, if anyone would like to comment on that, um, if not having access to the internet is, it could be included as a vulnerability. Emily, I, I, I don't know if you say... Vulnerability, but it's certainly an indicator of social exclusion. When mm -hmm. you look at the data of, of, of the, what is it, 18% um, of people who have no access to the internet, it, it's often a, a kind of leading indicator of lots of other issues that are going on. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Okay, let's go for two more in the last five minutes. Um, so through conversations with a resident, you've learned they've recently lost their job. So the same question again, what are the additional steps you could take to go above and beyond your duty? Whether that's steps, whether that is organisations you could point people to, um, websites or resources that you could send them, questions you could ask them. What are those additional things that you might be able to do um, if you came across this situation with a resident?
types of things that are coming through. Aside from the financial implications, understand why they lost their job is it part of a broader problem. And it feels like that's a bit of a theme of things that are coming through is, is don't just treat this thing in isolation, but kind of take the time to look at um, to look at their, the person's whole situation, their holistic situation, and understand the whole context. Um, some great places um, and other organisations here. Um, Job Centre, we've got Refer to Hackney Works. Giving benefits advice, checking if they've applied for benefits. Um, advising housing benefits and council tax. So again, working with other teams and services. We've got loads coming through here. Would anyone like to comment um, on this if they have any ideas about steps that we might be able to take as a service? I think it's good to, Josie, sorry, it's good to start working with people a bit at the beginning because uh, if the people that I spoke to through the debt project, something changes in their life and things start sparring out from that. So it's good if you start having a conversation with them right at the beginning about, okay, your circumstances have changed, you know, there will have to be some adjustments you need to make. Can we talk through that with you and and sort of get in at the beginning so then debts don't build. So you know what I mean? Mm. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And you know, again, very much the, the purpose of this is to stop things escalating, is to catch things early, which might be the loss of a job or the death of a loved one or a kind of significant uh, change or transition in someone's life and be able to support them early on. Um, so again, there's great resources coming through here. Would anyone else like to comment on this, uh, this scenario? Um, yeah, it's Glyn here. Hi, everyone. Yeah, going back to Josie's point, um, yeah, getting an understanding of their resilience, which we talked about earlier, I think is, is really important. So if you can understand how they can bounce back from this, so, you know, any big blow, whether it's bereavement or losing a job, people are going to react to it in different ways. So, for example, if they have mental health issues, this might be a bigger blow for them. It's going to be harder for them to come back from it and they may need more support. Whereas if they're losing their job and you can you can pick up that they'll be able to pick something up relatively easy or do it via themselves, then understanding that is really key, I think. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. That's definitely come through quite strongly in understanding um, what assets someone has, is understanding how resilient they are because everyone will respond to those situations differently. So it would be great um, to learn if anyone has any tools or resources for understanding resilience or questions that you'd ask people, you know, to kind of understand how they might have dealt with similar situations in the past. Um, it'd be great if, if you want to get in contact about any of those things. Should we do one more final scenario? Um, a resident mentions that they um, had a recent hospital admission um, for mental health reasons. So is there anything additional that you might be able to do to take that into account, to go above and beyond um, identifying that as a vulnerability, but making sure that that doesn't escalate or we're able to prevent homelessness where possible? So in the previous work that we did, mental health came out uh, as, as an indicator of a potential vulnerability, particularly um, an admission to hospital. So if you came across this day to day, is there anything else we might be able to do? Any other steps, questions to ask, people to link up with, websites to go on, organisations to signpost to, um, other teams or services we might be able to work with? 
can make sure that we're providing the right support to that person and preventing uh, homelessness where possible. So a couple of things that are coming out, provide reassurance that support is available. Don't be afraid to gently ask how this has affected them. Where do they feel they're the most vulnerable? Do they have a mental health support worker and can we get in touch with them? So again, that might be providing support around that bottom um, journey, that indigo pathway, providing that multidisciplinary support. I think there's, there's probably a valid uh, point here, which is about, you know, check out as people might say things to avoid other issues. Um, but in the past, people have been told that to avoid doing things. So again, is there balancing those up, I guess is important. If anyone would like to comment on, on that or, or other things. There's quite a lot coming through now. Would anyone like to comment on any answers here or anything that's come through? A nice question here, ask what does a good life look like for you? Would anyone like to comment? We've got a, we've gotten a few less uh, resources that have come through. Is that because this isn't a common scenario? Is that because people feel like there's there's very little we could do in this situation? Um, is it actually that that's just extremely common um, and doesn't doesn't mean someone's vulnerable? It'd be great to get some feedback on on this as a situation. Cool. This, this is the last um, situation, scenario that we've got to go through. So we can, we can leave it up if people have other um, things to put in. And so again, all of these five questions will help us start to build a bit of like a bank of resources and like useful next steps. So if people, um, if when we're understanding vulnerability, things like mental health or loss of uh, you know, a recent bereavement or loss of a job come up. This is loads of great content that can help us um, kind of give people a bit of inspiration about potential next steps that they could take, no matter how small, whether that's a question to ask, an organisation to point to, um, or particular steps they could take as part of building a shared plan. Has anyone got any other thoughts, questions, comments on the whole uh, show and share before we, before we call it a day today? Sorry, I have a quick comment. Yeah. Um, I just noted on that last exercise, none of us really had much to say about mental health or mental health support. And I just sort of wondered whether it's a matter of we don't understand it enough ourselves mm. in order to provide the level of support that's sort of needed. And obviously there is a level of support that's needed. Um, so maybe, I don't know, some guidance to, to show people pathways in that sort of sense, might help help in the, in that sort of sense. So, just as just a suggestion or, or comment, sort of. Yeah, thank you. Though. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, carry no, on. No, no, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Hi, uh, JC again. <laughs> um, what I've found in my experience is that um, the it's really hard to get people engaged properly with mental health services through no fault of the mental health services, they seem to be very underfunded and overworked. So um, 
although they might have someone there, they can't give them all the attention they need. And I know it's really difficult with the current uh, state of financial affairs uh, for these sort of things. But uh, what I find is, I, I think I said it earlier, is that if someone has, it doesn't, it's, if someone just has someone to talk to, to touch base with every few days, then that makes a massive difference to that person's mental health. They feel that someone's paying them attention and listening to them. And it doesn't have to be a mental health worker, but just someone that talks to space with them makes them feel validated and supported. Because a lot of people don't have support because their mental health issues can alienate other people around them. I'm talking to a few people at the moment who seem to be very isolated. And because their mental health means that um, quite often when they uh, contact services, they can be the sort of people that... Um, don't present well when they're talking to people and can get very agitated or can get obsessive about sending emails, things like that. So then, because we're all so busy and pushed, people can see them as a nuisance and it can put barriers between them just getting the basic help they need. So I, I just think if we had some level of befrienders, just a couple of people who could just touch base with those people on a regular basis it would make a massive difference to them sorry thank you <laughs> bye bye that's great thank you both for those comments i think that's really again important for us to to understand and to give you know to give officers prompts in an area that that likely isn't your speciality um so that when if we know that often people are presenting with, with mental health conditions or recent hospital admissions, that where you think it's appropriate that you have the resources at your disposal to take those extra steps. So I appreciate we have run a couple of minutes over. Uh, so thank you so much everyone for calling in this morning. It's great to have so much input um, and conversation around these different scenarios, which will help us again, build up those resources that can help officers take a next step after identifying a vulnerability. So feel free to stay on the line if you want to have a chat about anything, post questions or comments in the chat. We'll, we'll stay around for, for a few minutes for sure. Um, other than that, the video will go up on the Google Plus community if you want to re-watch your favourite hour of the week. But thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming along. Lovely to see so many uh, people today. And thanks for all of your input and ideas. It's been brilliant. So have a lovely week. Thank you very much.